Now we're going to look at some of the applications of mindfulness. So how is it useful in various things that are important and relevant to us in our study life, our professional life, and indeed our personal life. Now the applications of mindfulness are many and varied. So, and I'm going to give you a, a bit of a long list, but just to give you a sense of some of the things that have been studied up till now. Probably the most important single area has been the, the research on uh, the mental health benefits. Um, particularly when the studies came out on preventing the relapse of depression, people got very interested in mindfulness. But a whole range of other mental health problems as well have been studied. Then there's the neuroscience, so how, and this has already been mentioned in previous sections of uh, this introduction, how mindfulness actually changes the structure and the function of the brain. And, uh, and those have been already gone into. And it may actually be very important for helping to prevent um, de uh, dementia as well in later life. Uh, the clinical applications in health settings like uh, managing chronic pain or coping with cancer, making effective lifestyle change, um, and right down to our DNA. Performance, so a lot of athletes, um, uh, academic and leadership training for example. So a lot of people interested in improving performance can't do that unless they improve focus. Then there are the educational aspects. Again, we can't learn, we can't remember, we can't understand things effectively unless we can engage attention and get those executive functioning areas of our brain working for us rather than against us. In relationships and communication, again, attention is a prerequisite for empathy and really hearing what a person's saying and picking up very subtle cues that would otherwise be missed. And then of course there's the spiritual aspects because the world's great wisdom traditions have been interested in these things for thousands of years. We look on them as if they're something new but they're actually something very, very old. Now I'm going to say just a few words about some of these applications in a little bit more detail just because they're particularly important. So as was mentioned before about um, depression um, and poor mental health generally, mindfulness has been studied um, uh, for about 15 years now. So mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, for example, was developed to help people with depression specifically. But uh, better recovery, less depressive symptoms, uh, depressive relapse is half for people that have multiple episodes of depression before, and uh, it may actually be more effective than antidepressants. So the message is very good. That there's actually a lot that we can do rather than just crossing our fingers and hoping that we won't get depression or that we won't get further relapses of depression. There's actually a lot we can do for ourselves. So just to give you one study, just to illustrate the point, among now dozens of studies, in this study 106 people had had pr multiple previous episodes of depression are divided into two groups. Now one group gets the treatment as usual, which was essentially the, mainly the drug approaches to depression. The other group got treatment as usual, but they also got mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And then they followed what happened over the following year. And over the following year, as you can see, the red line is the mindfulness group. Very few people relapsed into depression if they had mindfulness training. The blue line is the relapse rate for the treatment as usual group. So by 12 months, more than half had already had their next episode of depression. Now that, unfortunately, is the expected prognosis with standard treatments for depression. The red line is not the expected prognosis. And when those studies started to come out, people really started to take mindfulness very seriously. And as has already been mentioned, depression uh, and mental health problems generally are one of the things that the legal profession are particularly at risk of. So this um, is very encouraging, but I think very important news for uh, um, professionals like uh, lawyers or, or law students moving into a highly demanding careers. Default mode network has been mentioned in previous sections as well, and it's extremely active in mental health problems like depression and anxiety and so on. What's interesting is if a person's brain's being studied while they're practicing mindfulness, as soon as the attention re-engages, the default mental activity switches off. But even more interesting is that if a person's been practicing this for a significant period of time, so over weeks and months, then even when the default mental activity switches on, the areas of the brain associated with self-monitoring and cognitive control switch on much more quickly. What does that mean? It means that the person's getting better at recognising that they've switched into unmindfulness or into default mode and gets much better at being able to choose, is that really where I want my attention to be? 
So for example, students who um, start to develop mindfulness will notice when they're sitting down to study much more quickly when the mind wanders off and are able to re-engage the attention with what they're studying. So it saves a huge amount of time, a wasted time that's often spent with the mind out the window when we're trying to get some work done. These studies on the brain um, uh, as well have been mentioned in previous sections, but you can see where areas of grey matter that are thickening up the longer a person's been practicing mindfulness. And it seems that mindfulness stimulates new brain cell growth in those areas. Quietens down the amygdala, that stress center, which is very overactive in anxiety and depression and so on. So it quietens that down, but it improves the functioning of the executive functioning areas of the brain. At uh, Monash University, we were the first university in the world to uh, embed mindfulness as core curriculum, um, initially for our medical students. And this study um, of the Monash medical cohort, um, all the students get it as a part of core curriculum, and they all have a series of tutorials and apply mindfulness, but we're looking at their mental health and well-being as they went throughout their first semester of university life. Now we measured them in a low stress period of semester and they had average mental health with um, your average 18 year old or first year medical student or, or student at university. Um, what normally happens is stress and depression goes up as the semester goes on. What we found was after the students had had the mindfulness program, 90% uh, of them said I'm personally applying this in my own day to day life. But what was really interesting was that everything we could measure about their mental health and well-being had significantly improved after the mindfulness program, despite the fact that they're in the highest stress period of semester. We're certainly very encouraged by that because it was the first time shown that you can improve mental health even in high pressure periods of the academic year. Further research we've done with our Monash uh, cohort as well is to find that the engagement with the mindfulness program was a significant predictor of engagement with the curriculum right across the board. So the more mindful the students became, the more engaged they became with their work and their study. So now we're going to explore some applications of mindfulness but with a bit more focus on those that are particularly important for learning, so for academic life. Uh, but of course the uh, implications are that these skills we learn for our academic life are important for our future professional life.